Good evening and uh, welcome to Mogga Hanger Park. We're going through a series of conversations here uh, looking at the history of Mogga Hanger Park and how it might relate to the present day and some of the conversations that can happen within the church and in wider society. And we normally like to do that by looking at the history and then comparing it with what's happening today. Well, one of the historical elements of Mogga Hanger Park is that the Clapham group, uh, known as the Clapham sect in their day, uh, used to meet here. Uh, the Thornton family, it was their family home, used to engage with the people who, such as William Wilberforce and others, would later deal with the abolition of transatlantic slavery. That's what they're famous for. But what we're really interested in tonight is that link that they commenced in concern for the Jewish people, in particular the idea that they obtained from the scriptures that there was a promise in those scriptures that the Jewish people would return to their land. And to help us with that conversation tonight, uh, it's a great privilege uh, to welcome Paul Haynes from the CMJ. You. Welcome to Mogahanga Park, Paul. Thank you, Danny. It's great to see you. It's good to be here. Tell us a little bit, Paul, about yourself and CMJ. Okay, um, so I'm uh, involved with this organisation, this CMJ. It's the Church's Ministry Among Jewish People. Um, we're a, a mission society, uh, began life in 1809, so the organisation's been around for a while. Yeah. And uh, the, the, the primary focus of the ministry was to tell Jewish people about the Jewish Messiah, Jesus. So that was the kind of the, the vision. What name did it have at the beginning, Paul? Um, uh, very politically incorrect. Was it was it? the London Society for Promoting Christianity Amongst the Jews. Right. So okay, so it's a Ron Seal ministry. It does what it says on the can, <laughs> as they say. Right. That's how it started. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and obviously it's CMJ. Uh, I think it's been CMJ for some time. Yeah, it's been CMJ for a long time, but, yeah. but it, it, even the CMJ's kind of subtly changed its, its emphasis. But we, uh, Ministry amongst Jewish people. Yes, and you, you, you personally, uh, and and Janie, is it? That, yeah, uh, my wife Janie. Yeah. yeah. So we've been involved since uh, 2000, uh, the, the short break. Mm. Um, both working here in the UK uh, with with the the UK work am amongst Jewish people and mm -hmm. education in, in churches. Mm -hmm. uh, we also spent five years in Jerusalem. Uh, CMJ has a centre just inside the old city in Jaffa Gate called Christ Church, yes. which is a church and it's a guest house. So we managed the guest house for five mm -hmm. years. And, and if I understand Christ Church as it, and it hits its history, mm -hmm. there's something about it being is it the first Protestant church that was constructed and that's right in the in the whole of the middle east yes that's right. so it's quite a strategic place indeed yeah. indeed um one of the things that um our culture is commemorating over the next four years mm -hmm. is this hundredth anniversary of the first world war yeah. and last year we, we looked at the um particularly the commencement obviously and it, it was quite a movement um particularly amongst christians to remember the truce uh, that took place. Yes. Uh, I think Sainsbury's even did a, a Christmas advert on that basis. And I understand the government want uh, the schools of the country to engage with the four main battles and then in 2018 the commemoration of the armistice. Mm -hmm. One thing that in conversations here at Mogga Hanger and having you here just is uh, so, so good to ask you, the Ottoman Empire and its yep. position prior to the First World War and its ultimate dismantling, as it were, by the end of it. It doesn't get spoken much about, you no. hear about the German, the Prussian situation, but could you tell us a bit about whether you think that part, the Ottoman Empire and its dissolution, yeah. is a significant part of the history that we should perhaps be commemorating? Yeah, I think it's, it's actually it's very significant. Right. Um, and it's, it, it's overlooked um, because in many senses, they were uh, uh, the kind of junior partner in the um, in, in the confederation of nations that, that fought against the British and the French, etc. The Allies. Um, but when you consider that um, at the time Turkey was uh, an empire that was something over 400 years old, yes. it was in decline. Uh, they were known as the sick man of Europe because of the economic situation and the, mm. kind of the, the, the moral situation there. Um, and yet the, 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 the leaders of the, the empire obviously had control over what we now know to be 
call the Middle East. Mm. Uh, it wasn't called that back in those days, but that's that's the area that the Turkey controlled. Mm. Um, of course, that constitutes today what we know as modern Israel, mm. and the uh, the possibility of a Jewish state being formed on that area of land would have been impossible had the Ottoman Turks still been uh, in control of that mm. area. And obviously, for those that have studied uh, some of the history of how Britain was used, um, yeah. many people think used by the Lord, to enable the Jewish people to <coughs> consider re-entry into the land, is the Balfour Declaration of 1917. Would you consider that significant as oh, well? Absolutely, yeah. I think um, uh, the uh, kind of a quick overview of the history was that for the previous probably 200, 250 years, um, Christians in Britain had been kind of considering this idea of is there going to be a return of the Jewish people? Mm -hmm. the, the prophets seem to indicate that. By the time we come to the First World War, uh, for a hundred years prior to that, there had been uh, pretty much mainstream evangelical thinking was yes, this was going to happen. Mm -hmm. Some most influential evangelical speakers uh, during that period would have subscribed to that view and we're looking at people like the Wesleys, John Newton, mm -hmm. um, Charles Simeon, uh, Bishop J.C. Ryle, even Charles, Charles Spurgeon, Spurgeon. Yeah, yep, all these, these people, yeah. uh, recognised that at some point uh, it, was, it was just a matter of fact they didn't understand how it was going to happen uh, mm. because of the, 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 the politics of the area. Yeah. But by the time we come to the, the First World War and the Ottoman Empire's in decline, mm. once the war was over and that empire was dismantled, um, it was basically uh, it was Britain and France put together what the modern map that we see of the Middle East. Right. This is often, I think, well, it may be forgotten, but it's certainly not... Um, dealt with in any of the conversations I've heard so far. No, it's, it, uh, it's kind of a, an ignored yeah. area. <laughs> it seems to me that there's a couple of things that arise from that that would be very applicable to mm. um, the situation in our land today with, with the church and its approach to Jewish people, but also the Middle East. And it would be that statement that you mentioned then about it being effectively mainstream yep. evangelical understanding, that there was a, a sort of place in the scripture for loving Israel in that way, that yeah. she had a purpose still. Um, could you could you say you find that to be the case today? No. I think um, my experience of, of, of traveling around churches is the, the small pockets of people who would subscribe to that theology, and there's one or two uh, kind of denominations uh, or, or, or Christian groupings that would, would go along with that. But I think the vast majority of evangelicals, it's either they're very, no, it's definitely not the case, mm. or, well, it's not something that we need to think about too much. Right. Uh, there's other more pressing issues that we need to consider in church. So that's tied to the other question I'd like to raise from that uh, idea that what was mainstream, yes, isn't now. Mm -hmm. But the idea that the outworking of God's purposes has a political yeah. dimension. Yeah. Again, would you say, obviously for the Balfour and people like him, this was obvious. Yeah. Would you say again today that's the case? Um, yeah, that people see politics and the kingdom and God yeah, working his purposes out through uh, these things? I think, um, I, I think there is an element within the church of, of people that, that, that see that happening. Uh, but certainly... Uh, in the years that followed the First World War and through and probably after the Second World War, um, evangelicals generally shied away from politics. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, we're in the world, but we're not of it, so we don't get involved in that kind yeah. of thing. We yeah. preach the gospel, and that's, that's it. Um, there's certainly been a move back towards a more kind of political thinking, I think, in the recent past. Yes. Uh, but that hasn't necessarily gone in hand with a... Um, a reading of scriptures that would lead to belief in that there's a restoration of Jewish people and the modern state of Israel is it's somehow part and parcel of God's purposes for Jewish people and his whole kind of uh, history of salvation. One of the things that uh, strikes me is that um, with the emergence uh, of ISIS, ISIL, mm. IS, uh, that different uh, mm -hmm. phraseology, this, this idea of a refinding of a caliphate, uh, the, yep. the Ummah, um, it's harking back again 
to the ideas of the Ottoman Definitely. era, isn't it? Do, yeah. you, do you think there's some significance there uh, in trying to understand what might be happening? Uh, yeah, I think so, because history does tend to repeat itself. Um, patterns, as Yes, it? patterns. And um, uh, a good friend of mine has doing some recent research into the whole matter and found that one of the, um, the aims of the Ottoman Turks was actually to destroy the ancient Christian uh, communities in the Middle East, right. um, as well as um, putting a stranglehold on any aspirations that the Jewish people had for self-determination. Mm. And so there's very definite parallels, I think, in what we're seeing with the, this modern caliphate that's been declared. Yeah, and that again raises that question, Genesis chapter 12, where it talks right from the outset of this promise made to Abraham and his people, the seed of Abraham, uh, that those that blessed them would see blessing yeah. and those that cursed them would find cursing. Cursing. Would you say then that it's not just at a personal level, but that maybe even at a national, international level, yeah. that principle might be one of the explaining factors of history itself? seems to be very much the case if you look at the uh, the empires Isn't that have risen up against Israel and the Jewish people who have tried to either destroy them or put them into uh, some some place of uh, sort of inferior cultural position not many of them exist. You were telling empires. me um, before that there's actually a T-shirt, isn't there? Yeah, that's that you right. Find it brings home that point in a, a light way, but yeah. doesn't it basically say? Yeah, the, the um, Israelis are pretty good at laughing at themselves, uh, but it's, it's basically it's a, it's a list of empires that have, have uh, raised their arm against God's Jewish people. And that's uh, going back uh, to it goes right the way back to Egypt, uh, the Babylonians, the Persians, um, the, the the Ottomans, uh, right, and uh, it picks up on oh, some of the more modern nations as well. Yeah, uh, and this so is where again we're seeing a rise of yeah. anti-Semitism. Um, uh, in the news when this goes out, even this day we've heard yeah. um, in France of an attack uh, That's because right. someone had been viewed presumably by extremists as uh, being sarcastic in cartoons towards uh, the Prophet Muhammad. The issues that we face today are running into some lots of dead ends it seems. Mm. Young it men is. and women wanting to find hope in politics, we read yeah. these figures that less than half of those, I think, between 30 and 18 first-time voters will actually bother to vote. Mm -hmm. There's a loss of connection with politics. Yep. Do you think the church could cause there to be an interest in these things if they understood that God's at work, and particularly at work yeah, in I the think, Middle East? Um, I, I think they, the, the church and sort of parachurch organisations mm. like CMJ could yes. actually be involved in that education process. Yeah. Um, it's not easy. Uh, uh, I think some young people are politically motivated, yeah, early but the, the, the trendy kind of political position at the moment, and I, I, I don't mean that in a demeaning way, but it's kind of very much like, is, is to um, sort of stand for matters of injustice. Mm. Uh, and certainly the, the Middle Eastern conflict uh, until the rise of ISIS is almost specifically I think been seen as a matter of injustice to the Palestinians by Israel. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, in the scriptures obviously we read the David and Goliath story and that's kind of been reversed so that now Israel is Goliath and the Palestinians are David. That's fascinating you say that Paul because the way in which particularly the BBC covered the Gaza mm -hmm. um, conflict with Israel in uh, 2014 until the story started to come through as to what was happening in northern Iraq, which were more deaths in a day than the whole conflict yeah. in the Gaza-Israel conflict, one was aware that there was, a, there was a strong media sense of indiscriminate or disproportionate retaliation. Yeah, that's yeah? right. Is that what you mean? Yes, yeah. Uh, uh, and if you kind of look at the situation in isolation without having tracked back through a bit of recent history, mm. it's very easy to draw those conclusions. But um, having lived in Israel, right. uh, we, we you know, there from 2005 to 2010, right. um, during that period alone, we know that there was something over three and a half thousand rockets came out of Gaza into Israel. Yes. 
Yes. Now, you can have a five year period, three and a half thousand rockets, maybe when you divide that by days, it doesn't sound very mm. much. Mm. But if you're living in the area where a, a rocket can land, mm. uh, and although they're, they're often described in the media as homemade, mm. you know, they, they still destroy the room that we're sitting in, if yes, one landed it, uh, do some pretty serious damage to you and I mm. as well. Mm. Mm. Um, if you're living under conditions where that could happen at any moment, mm. it doesn't make living easy. And so, so it's understandable that Israel takes decisive action to try and stop that happening. And that's what I think is fascinating about revisiting the history, mm -hmm. is that if men and women reading the scriptures before any knowledge of the present political perception, yep. they could see the promises in the scripture. Yeah, that seems to be Now, the right. if you start with what you perceive as the justice issue in the land, yep. the scriptures seem to be relegated as less important than Yes, that. that seems to be the way. Now, Janie, your wife, I understand, works within CMJ to try and bring the message uh, yep. that we're talking about here to young men and women. Yeah, that's right. Is that particularly difficult in, in the UK? Um, We're beginning to win some victories. <laughs> no, that's interesting. Um, it's it, it, it's not easy. Um, I think many church leaders, many uh, even sort of youth organisation leaders, would shy away from the issue of Israel because of the kind of political fallout that can that can go on with it. Um, but having represented CMJ at several different youth events uh, in this country over the past five years since we've been back, you know, some of the big summer camps that go on. Um, it's quite surprising the number of young people that once you start to engage them on a scriptural level, yes. they get it, yes. uh, they, they, they understand, um, and I think that's, that's the place that we have to work. Yeah. Uh, Would you say that we're in a place where we're laying before people that if we read scripture this way, yeah. Do you concur that this is what it says, yeah. rather than starting anywhere else? I think that's the only way that we can do it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's the only way is to go back. It's, uh, uh, and, and I think the basis of it always has to be, let's go back to Jesus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because once you kind of take your eyes off him, yes. you're liable to kind of go off down And that's any where track. we would be guarded, wouldn't we, uh, against any extreme position. Yeah. We love Palestinian people because Absolutely. Jesus does. But this issue of the land and his purposes yeah. with Israel are, are not against anyone. I've always thought that, that they're just that he's for them. Yes. Well, and yes. therefore for others through them. Yeah. And it's that choice that he's made that yeah. causes this yeah. antagonism. Would you? Would you yeah. And, and, and I guess human nature doesn't like the fact that uh, a group of people have been chosen over against another group of people mm. uh, we kind of we, we fight against that and mm. uh, again because of the the, the kind of uh, the way that we're kind of conditioned to think even mm. as, as Christians mm. um, or God doesn't play favorites and no he doesn't but he certainly chooses people in scriptures to yes. fulfill his purpose yes. and in this particular case it seems that he chose a people group mm. to fulfill his purposes. Those, those chapters in, in, in the book of Romans 9 uh, 10 and 11 in yep. particular make that extremely clear that it's yep. he's making a sovereign choice yeah that's right and I, I find that fascinating do you think that part of the reaction that we see from from Islam itself is that sense that they've interpreted that as a rejection and are, are wanting to say that the line runs through Ishmael runs beyond yep. Jesus uh, all those sorts of conversations if if we could begin to engage with some of the things that CMJ makes clear through its ministry. Yeah. Do you think it would help us in our dialogue with Islam as well? Um, I say that, and that's controversial. Yeah, it is controversial, and, and, but I'd, I'd like to think that it would. Mm. Um, uh, I guess I, I probably don't know enough about Islam to, to make a really informed comment on this, but I, my suspicion is that at the moment, um, Islam is not ready for that kind of reform thinking yet. Yeah, the reason I was mentioning it, we'd been hearing some um, prophetic uh, statements that were weighing and testing, mm -hmm. particularly through Issachar Ministries, a, a sister ministry at yep. Loganga Park historically, that maybe the ISIS overreaching is causing there to be a questioning within 
Islam, yeah. particularly those that were resident in the West, and that may be an opportunity of seeing that we're not saying what they think we're saying when we say that we think the Lord loves the Jewish people. He doesn't, he doesn't hate everyone else. Yeah. That idea, um, I just wonder, and I wondered if young people, because they're seeing some of the atrocities yeah. committed in the name of what those extremists say is, is Islam, but when you then compare what Israel has to fight against when it's attacked, just wonder if it might be. Mm. Um, this is why the conversation here at Mogah Hanger will continue. We, um, we're wanting to try and make this a space where this conversation, particularly within church, and the Hebraic roots of theology, mm -hmm. which is part of the education yeah. aspect, isn't it, of CMJ, is so important to us. Um, in our last um, five minutes, uh, what would you say are the key issues in education on this subject that you would want people to take from tonight, this conversation? Um, I think we... Uh, uh, CMJ, one, one of the things that we're trying to do is encourage people to go back to reading the Bible. Um, a lot of Christians don't know their Bibles ever so well. The, the whole Bible. Yeah, the whole Bible. Yeah. Um, and, and I think, again, it, it's, it's, it's something of a, a, a theological trend that um, if you can start giving it technical terms, mm. it's um, eisegesis rather than exegesis. So we're okay. reading into scriptures yeah. our, our preconceived ideas rather than actually saying, okay, this is what God says, what does this mean? Mm. Um, and so it's, it, and it's, it's kind of easy to do, actually. Mm. Yes, to, to, I'm to sure do we do it without realising it. Uh, and we do really do it without realising it in all sorts of different ways, not just mm. over the issue of Israel. Sure. Um, but to kind of encourage people to, to get back to, to, to looking at scriptures and saying, okay, what actually is God saying here? Not what do I think he's saying or what would I like him to be saying, yeah. but what is he saying? Yeah, and it does seem as though that's how the early um, movement towards no. identifying what the scripture said did just that, didn't it? Certainly, yeah. It didn't really, even in its day, it sounded quite, as you said earlier, and I find it so fascinating that given the context of the Ottoman Empire, mm -hmm. given what the realities were, even up to the First World War, yeah. to believe these things, even at the time probably of the Balfour Declaration, looked yeah, how, totally how could this possibly happen? Yeah, yeah. that's right. And that's been forgotten, I think, yeah. because we now live here and we look backwards. That's right, yeah. Um, yeah. So that's why I think what we're yeah. hoping at the Mogahanger Conversations is that historical understanding helps us at least make proposals for people's consideration yeah. in the present. As we um, come to the end of our conversation, Paul, um, there's something, I think, very significant about places that started something yeah. and get another chance to do it. And here at Mogahanger, 200 years later, after the original 1812 shape of the place that's been restored, um, we understand that the movement towards abolition of slavery is obviously remembered, but there were something like 147 different societies that were birthed out of yeah. the movement. Do you think um, CMJ could, in this day, begin to move with confidence back into sharing some of these things if there was a platform that could transmit that in partnership with them. Is there any yep. way in which you think people joining together um, with ministries such as yours that have been yep. all this time consistent would help? Definitely, yeah. Right. Yeah, I think uh, I, I, this, we've already talked about this history repeating itself and I don't yeah, think it's insignificant again. that uh, the um, the Thorntons and their uh, sort of compatriots in the in the Clapham group began that prayer meeting here when the UK was in a pretty much a similar state financially and morally to yes, what it's been in the last well, um, yes. in the last sort of ten fifteen years mm. since the the two thousand and seven crash. Yes, and so there's there's this kind of sense that maybe things are going around. So CMJ definitely would want to be involved in that. Uh, that, that new dialogue. Yeah, we, we're, we're offering, um, and in these, this series of interviews, mm. we've been talking to other people such as Spuck, for instance, who mm. uh, are saying that um, the unborn is seen as a non-person, and yep. how that has parallels. And obviously Jewish people seen as non-persons through the Second World War. There's something about um, the resonance with what the Lord did yep. 200 years ago that now presents itself again on okay. many yep. levels. So uh, movements, um, societies as they were called then, but um, movements that collaborate together 
uh, could be quite an exciting time. Yeah, and, I think um, so. We obviously want to thank you for, for coming this evening. It's a pleasure. What, as people um, go away from hearing us have this conversation, can we be praying for, for CMJ uh, at this time? Um, I think, uh, without giving you a long list of prayer points, I think that, um, that, that we take the opportunities that are presented to, uh, to use platforms such as this uh, and other opportunities yeah, yeah. to get that message over that God still cares for the Jewish people, mm. that uh, he has um, purposes for them, yes. uh, and that as Christians we owe a debt to the Jewish people for mm. what they've given us. Mm. Paul makes a long list in Romans, yes. um, the scriptures, the prophets, etc. Mm. But most of all, the Messiah. W without the Jewish people, there wouldn't be, we wouldn't even have a concept of what a Messiah right. is. Yeah. So there would be no Jesus. Right. So you've obviously brought it as all our conversations end up in this place which is about Jesus absolutely and it really isn't it it's that love for him yep. and then finding out that he has such a love for the Jewish people that motivates us yep. isn't it yeah because um, it's his own people yeah this is a, yeah. the thing and I, I'm always very moved by the idea that as he returns blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Lord. will be heard from his own people yeah so we hope you found our conversation interesting. We uh, are in the dialogue. It's only really beginning, but this is another insight uh, over the next four years as our culture looks at the First World War. Thank you. Thank you.